Jimmy, I'm an alcoholic. Grateful to be alive and sober. You might remember me. I was here about four days ago. Uh, <laughs> and a uh, couple of observations uh, I need to make. When I first came up, it was really easy to get up these three stairs. I just needed an elevator to get up here just now. I'm t it's, it's a tiring day, so I really give credit to you guys who were hanging in there all day long. And uh, some young lady said to me earlier, like right at the beginning, uh, maybe she heard me cough, she goes, I got some lozenges up here. And uh, she goes, they're pretty powerful. They uh, stick to the top of your mouth. They're from England. And then they do something to you that makes you really like weird. So I just sat here the whole day looking at that box saying, I wonder what would happen if I take three of those things. <laughs> maybe we could crush them up and snort them. Was, maybe we could do something like that. But uh, what a great day. Oh, I have a Zoom story. So I'm doing a Zoom talk in California, and uh, it is getting bombed left and right. And they finally got control of it. And uh, through the talk, at the end of the talk, uh, the way they called, they, the chairperson called each you know, uh, person in the windows, or whatever you call that, the box. And so they're going through the thing, going through the thing, and then this 13-year-old kid gets on there. And he goes, hi, mister, uh, I'm the Zoom bomber, but I've never been to an AA meeting, so I sat in to listen to your talk, and I really enjoyed your talk. And all I could think of is, I can't wait, wait to read your story in a sixth or seventh edition or something like that, you know? It's like, you just never know, right? That was pretty cool, I thought. So I know it's gifts, I mean, it's promises from the uh, big book, but... Uh, I want to read a promise that's in the 12 and 12, uh, specifically for this step. When a man or woman has a spiritual awakening, the most important meaning of it is that he's now become able to do, feel, and believe that which he could, could not do before on his unaided strength and resources alone. Promise. He has been granted a gift which amounts to a new state of consciousness and being. Promise. He has been set on a path which tells him he's really going somewhere. Promise. That life is not a dead end. Promise. Not something to be endured or mastered. Promise. In a very real sense, he has been transformed because he has laid hold of a source of strength which one way or another he had until now denied himself. Promise. He finds himself in a possession of of a degree of honesty. Promise. Tolerance. Promise. Unselfishness. Promise. Peace of mind. Promise and love, promise, of which he had thought himself quite incapable. What he has received is a free gift. And yet, usually, at least in some small part, he has made himself ready to receive it. Uh, what are you doing with your gift? And what is the gift? Is the gift to be awakened? Is the gift that I just stepped out into the sunlight of the spirit? You know, you thought the gift was this... I don't know, my mind has changed a lot lately with the gift. The gift of consciousness, the gift of being awake, the gift of being aware of the things that are going on in my life without judgment. The gift of being able to see things in a different view. You know, uh, taking these glasses off and looking at something different. I, uh, it was a consideration, it might have been Peter, it might have been an old sponsor. And the consideration is, do I look at the people in my life, the situations in my life, and the circumstances in my life through the lens of a character defect or through the eyes of God? So how do I look at the people in my life, my family, my coworkers, my sponsees, my sponsor, members of Alcoholics Anonymous, my neighbors, on and on and on, a stranger in traffic? Do I look at that person with anger or rage or fear or envy or jealousy or, or the like? Or do I look at people now with compassion? And forgiveness. Love and tolerance is our code, is it really? So it's a big question for me, the gift, and what I'm doing with the gift. And like I shared earlier, I was raised by two wolves, right? I had it all wrong about my parents, like probably most of us in this room right now. Right? I made it all about me. I didn't see the level of selfishness and self-centered I lived under. And like we've discussed all day long at the steps we went through, and to start to uncover, discover, and discard the things that are blocking me from God and blocking me from another person. To see the truth about relationships, because Peter always talks about it, it's the most important thing we have is relationships. 
with each other, with God, with everyone around us? What do those relationships look like? Early in my AA career, 12-step calls were a common, a common thing. It was like not like any day of the week, the guy Richie Schnorr, who uh, 12-stepped me in Newark Airport, he became my sponsor on day one. He would call me up on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It didn't make a difference. He'd call me up at 11 o'clock at night. And all he would say is, you got 10 minutes to be downstairs. Now, I didn't like say, well, what are we doing? Or, you know, where are we going? And I knew where we were going. We were going to a drunk's house. And he would pull up in the car and he'd have, you know, another old timer of me and another young guy. And we'd go be doing a 12 step call on someone, someone who needs help like Peter just talked about. And we get to that house and we all had a role and my role as a young guy was to make sure there was no weapons or the kids were all right or the wife was all right. The other young guy, he had to make sure that, you know, everything was okay in one way or another. And then we'd walk into the living room and we'd see the magic. And what the magic was, was these two old times would sit down and they'd tell their story to this alcoholic. And then they'd ask him that question. Are you willing to go to any length for victory over alcohol? And do you want help? And if that guy said yes, what we did was we didn't take him to a detox because we really didn't have many detoxes around. We didn't take him to a treatment center because there wasn't a lot of treatment centers around. We take him to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And what I would witness the first time out doing that is that these old timers would keep a pint or a half a pint of whiskey in their glove compartment. And I didn't understand that in the beginning. I was like, whoa, we're allowed to do that? You know, and uh, <laughs> wow, not bad to say anything, huh? <laughs> but then I learned very quickly, it's in case that guy went into, you know, uh, you know uh, an episode or, uh, or convulsions or anything like that, right? So I was well versed in what a 12-step call was and having that conversation with an alcoholic who really needed us. I'm 18 months sober. Doing pretty good. Back with the wife, got the job, got all those things. Not working the steps yet. But I'm an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm part of a home group. I'm doing all my commitments in the home group, setting up, breaking down, you know, making coffee, doing all the things we do in a home group. And, uh, and uh, so I leave the home group one day. No, I didn't leave the home group. I left the job one day, and I go to visit my parents, and uh, I found my father dead. Right on the floor. Boom. Right there. Dead. 63 years old. Three years younger than I am right now. And so I'm programmed. I call my sponsor. I say to my sponsor, what do I do? He goes, call 911, and let's pray. So I call 911 and we're praying over my father. And I can't even tell you the prayers we were saying. I just know he was talking, I was listening and crying at the same time. Then all of a sudden a cop comes, the first cop comes to my house. And he's taking down the information and he's writing down and all of a sudden he looks at me and says, uh, I don't see you walking the streets anymore. I said, yeah, I don't do that anymore. Taking a little bit more information down, he goes, matter of fact, I don't even see you drinking in the bars anymore. I said, yeah, I don't do that either. He goes, well, how do you do that? I go, I, well, I go to this thing called Alcoholics Anonymous and I'm sober 18 months. And he starts to talk to me about his drinking over my father's dead body. I'm programmed for a 12-step call. I could hear the cry for help. I wound up 12 stepping this cop over my dead father's body. Didn't see him ever again until last year. I'm in my home group, we have a big home group where we are, anywhere between two, 300 people every Sunday night. A lot of activity. The girls are reading over there, the guys are reading over here. Also, oh, the guys are over there lying about something, you know, we're doing something. There's always activity, it's a pocket of enthusiasm. When all of a sudden, I get a tap on my shoulder, and I turn around, the guy looks familiar to me, but I don't know who he is. And he introduces himself, says his, his name, and he says, I was the police officer that was with you the night that your father died. And I went to AA that next day after talking to you. 
And I'm here to let you know that I, I've been sober 34 years now. I don't tell you that because I have the power to get anyone sober. I don't have the power to get anyone loaded. I tell you that because the gift, that God will use you without your permission. If I think of a drink, I've got to reach for a drunk. That's what the old timers used to say, right? And what I understood on that day, that God used me on that day, even in the worst of times, even in the hardest of times, when you think of a drink, reach for a drunk. It's our saving grace. That's the gift. That we have this spiritual toolbox that's laid at our feet. And all we really need to do is to pick up those tools and apply them to our life. And what happened on that day was my real first spiritual truth became known to me. That in order to get out of the darkness of my life, I need to serve others. And isn't that what we do in Alcoholics Anonymous? We serve others. We carry the message to the best of our ability. We've been given a priceless free gift. So what are you doing with your gift? You know, there wasn't many, prom uh, many prayers in, you know, I went through this like an anal college kid looking for answers. I've only read the book a million times, so I was like, where's the prayers, you know? <laughs> so working with others, I mean, you could take any, you could take any line and turn it into a prayer if you wanted to, but, but in, on page 164 in a vision for you, it says, ask him in your morning meditation what you could do each day for the man who's still sick. So this is all about the promises. Carry this message to the alcoholic. You could help when no one else can. You could secure their confidence when others fail. Made me think about that day with that cop. Maybe he asked for help a million and one times. Maybe he went to an EAP or, you know, employee assistance program. Maybe he's been to 10 treatment. I never knew what happened to that guy. But on this particular day, God put two drunks together. And no matter what was going on below our kneecaps, like my dead father, the truth of the matter is one drunk talking to another. Our basic service that we offer in Alcoholics Anonymous. I would never have been awake to that if I didn't do what everyone has been talked about today. I would never have seen that. I would have made that situation all about me and missed the whole point of what we do here. The other wolf that I was raised by is called mom. And I didn't talk about her earlier, but you know, these two stories are just really uh, uh, illustration of the gift. So when my dad died, my mother never got remarried. My mom was an old school city lady, right? Never drove a car in her life, walked everywhere. My mom was a Jane Fonda workout freak. <laughs> For you all older people, you might remember her. Leotards, VCR in the thing, dancing to like the, oh no, that was Richard Simmons. That's same, well, you know what I mean, it's the, it's the same, same thing. And my mom was in great shape. You know, like all through her 50s and 60s, my mom was, and she walked everywhere. She walked miles every day. My mom was always in good shape. So she was about 90 years old, and, uh, and the doctor came to uh, us and said, uh, your mom needs a, a knee replacement. And we're like, what are you, out of your mind? She's 90 years old. He goes, she's in better shape than all your five kids put together. She needs a knee replacement. So my mom got a knee replacement at 90 years old. Never took a pain pill. I've had three knee replacements. My wife's had three knee replacements. Not to say we're junkies, but we had to take pain pills. <laughs> take the edge off, I mean, you know. You have to sleep eventually, you know. Uh, here's the problem, and maybe if you're a doctor in here or a nurse or if that medical profession, uh, when you're that old and you get put under anesthesia, now my mom was slipping a little bit, her mind but the anesthesia put her into full-blown dementia. My mom was shot out. And so we're sitting at my house one day, and, uh, and my mom's looking at me, and we're having lunch, me, my wife, Mary Beth, and my mother, and, and, and she looks at me and she goes, where were you? Where were you? I walked the streets for two years looking for you. Where were you? And my mind wanted to rationalize that. 
And my mind wanted to come up with an excuse. My mind wanted to say, Mom, I made amends to you 27 years ago. What are you talking about? I thought we were clear. You know, there's so many things that were jumbling up in my mind. But God just grabbed me by the back of the head and said, be quiet. And I listened to her say it a couple more times. And then after about 30 seconds, she didn't even know who I was. It was very hard for us to take care of my mother. We, you know, one, one night I get a, my son comes from out of where he lives and like our phones were ringing, we didn't hear him. My mother walked out of her house and she was walking the streets down the sh Jersey Shore at three o'clock in the morning, not even knowing where she was. We knew we had to put her somewhere. We couldn't take care of her anymore. And we put her into an assisted living place. And uh, what happened was uh, we put her in the assisted living and uh, COVID hit. And the whole joint got COVID. And my mom died at 94 years old of COVID and dementia in an assisted living place. But I want to tell you about that day because the gift was in my life. The gift that you guys have shared with me, the gift these guys are talking about all day, it's a gift. I didn't know it was going to be a gift. So the hospice nurse, thank you, Chris, for the work you do and everyone that, and your wife, I know that. But this one hospice nurse calls me up. I'm coming out of physical therapy. I just had my third knee replacement. She calls me up. She goes, you need to get here. Your mom's going. She's going to die any minute, and you need to be here. Because I was the closest sibling or the closest child. My brothers and sisters are all around the country. And so about two miles away is the, the, you know, the assisted living. I go there, and uh, back in the early days of COVID or the pandemic, you remember, if you did anything, you had to take a test. You had to put the PPE on and all that other stuff. And then... Um, you know, so I did that, and uh, the hospice nurse stops me. She goes, I want to tell you something. Your mom's not going to be able to open her mouth or open her eyes, but she's going to know you're here. Now, I got my sisters, two of them, hitting me up that let's take a, get mommy on the phone, FaceTime it. Like, we haven't seen my mother in six months now because everything was shut down in Jersey. But... We didn't know the extent of what she was going to look like. FaceTime her, FaceTime her. Thank God I never FaceTime her. Because when that nurse pulled open that, that, that curtain, what was laying in the bed was a skeleton. And in my mind, I think I'm walking in to see my 60-year-old version of my mom, the Jane Fonda one. And there's a skeleton laying in that bed. The gift. I've been given a gift. So I walk in, and I sit next to her, I grab her hand, I said, hi, Mom. And her chest exploded with like oxygen. Her son has come home. The gift. And I had that moment. The moment we hear from a million podiums, the moment you guys hear from every meeting you go to of the evidence of the power of the gift the gift of sobriety, the gift of a relationship with a power greater than yourself, the gift of God. And I sat with my mom and I talked to her for, I don't even know how much. And when I walked out of that, she died an hour later. The gift. I didn't know at the moment what that gift was. And I'm sure I'm not gonna find it in here but does God really hear our prayers? Does God really hear our prayers? The prayer of St. Francis, Lord, make me a channel of thy peace, that where is hatred, I may bring love, that where I may bring wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness, and that where there is discord, I may bring harmony, where there is error, I may bring truth, where there is doubt, I may bring faith. Where there is despair, I may bring hope. Where there is shadows, I may bring light. And where there is sadness, I may bring joy. It was a joyful moment to be able to be the one who was able to sit with my mother as she took her last breaths. To let her know that dad's waiting for her in heaven or wherever that place is in the universe. That's the gift. 
You know, we could still stand up here and pontificate about what the gift of the spiritual awakening, the psychic change, the personality change, whatever you want to call it. It's really about practicing these principles in all our affairs. You know, it's really easy to walk into a meeting and uh, read the 10th step off the, off the shade and, you know, we think we just click our heels, acknowledge our wrongs and make our amends and move on with our day. There's nothing further from the truth when you read our literature. Step 10 says we've entered the world of the spirit. What these guys have talked about today is that we have now been out there in the sunlight of the spirit living this way of life. And yeah, we step back into the darkness once in a while, but we have the tools, 10, 11, 12, to get back into the light. So we've entered the world of the spirit and we've been given a gift, the gift of awareness, the gift of being awake, to carry this message to the alcoholic who still suffers. And we do that in a lot of different ways. Life will take on a new meaning as a promise to watch people recover, to see them help others, to watch loneliness vanish, to see the fellowship grow about you, to have a host of friends. This is an experience you must not miss. We know that you will, will not want to miss it. Frequent contact with newcomers and with each other's is the bright, bright spot of our lives. Marion said it on the first talk today. Please, if you're on the edges here, come on all the way in and sit all the way down. And I can guarantee you that those feelings of isolation and loneliness will vanish and it will be replaced with friendships and relationships you never knew that could happen. The gift, the gift of Alcoholics Anonymous. We are not alone anymore. We have each other. We have a place where we can come, whether we're happy, whether we're sad, whether we're whatever, we can meet in that precious spot called the parking lot before the meeting or after the meeting and talk about what's bothering us and the evidence is all around us of people who have been through everything. Bankruptcies, divorce, death, loss of children, loss of parents, loss of job, you name it. We've been given a gift. Am I awake to that? Am I awake that I have a place to come? Assuming that we're spiritually fit, we could do all sorts of things alcoholics are supposed to do or not supposed to do. My biggest question when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, how do you go to a Yankee game and not drink? <laughs> now that's a, that's a common question for a newcomer. How do you go to a barbecue and not drink? How do you have a hamburger and not drink? How do you go to the bar, uh, you know, down the shore to the beach and not drink? You know, all these things. And see, the gift is the guys that, and the girls that came before me to show me how to live a sober life, to put on events, to do the things that we do that regardless of anything, we could stay sober and have a good life and a good time living this life. It's the gift, the gift that we've all been given today. Your job now is to be a place where you be a maximum helpfulness to others. So never hesitate to go anywhere if you can be helpful. You should not, you should not hesitate to visit the most sordid spot on earth on such an errand. Keep on the firing line of these motives and God will keep you unharmed. Helping others. What are my motives? To get a notch on my belt because I sponsored 20 something guys? Or is this really about what Silkworth talks about, the altruistic movement that's among us, amongst us, the unselfishness of these people? You know, I think of Silkworth quite often because we live right by Silkworth's grave and we've all been over there a lot of times in Jersey. You know, and I think about every time I pass Glenwood Cemetery in West Long Branch and I look in there, and many times when I look in there, I know where his headstone is. And when I look over there, I, what do I see? I see two of you girls. You got your beach chairs out, you got your big book in your lap. I see two of you guys, you got folding chairs, you're sitting there. And what I witness is the gift. One drunk told it to another. Experiencing, sharing experience, strength, and hope. It's what we do. That's the gift we've been given to carry this message to the best of our ability to the guy or the girl that needs help, right? Somewhere along the lines, God put me on another path. We started my home group, well we, my, not my home group, but our home group, uh, 2005, we had a meeting in my house. We wanted to bring a three legacy group to our area. 
I belonged to a different group than my wife at the time. And uh, I called 12 people, people that had a great experience in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I put together a steering committee in my living room. And like Bill Wilson writing, you know, hammering out the, transi uh, the, the traditions on the anvil of experience, we were trying to start a group on our experience of being members for a long time in Alcoholics Anonymous. And so we put the format together and we knew we wanted to do what we wanted to do. And then we went to prayer. And we prayed that 30 people would show up to our first night on January 22nd, 2006. And that night, 175 people showed up. And we had a bunch of tables. We had to like ditch the tables. We need more chairs. And like I said, we moved once, but we, we average a lot of people on a Sunday night. We've been given a gift where I live, the gift of sobriety. And after the first year, we were meeting the first year. After the, after the first year, we became a group. I hope you know the difference between a meeting and a group. We have a pamphlet, the AA group, where it all begins, explains all of that stuff. But we needed a GSR. We need someone that would, you know, we could delegate our authority to so they can keep our group informed of AA as a whole. And they wanted me to be the GSR. And I'm 19 years sober at the time. I don't want to be the GSR. <laughs> you know why? I was afraid. Because I didn't know what it meant. I didn't understand the structure. I didn't understand any of that stuff. I'm a good home group member. I feel comfortable in my home group, but now I'm being asked to step out of my comfort zone. I didn't see the gift in the moment. So, you know that you know that when your hand raises in a business meeting and you're talking to your arm like, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> That's what happened to me. And now I'm your GSR for the Design for Living Group in Neptune, New Jersey. It's 2007, we're having the Northeast Regional AA Service Assembly in Hunt Valley, Maryland. That's where all the GSRs, all the service junkies go. And I go down to Hunt Valley, Maryland, terrified, because I'm afraid, because I don't know. And I'm ignorant to AA. I know the book a little bit by now, I mean a lot by now. I sponsor a lot of guys, I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one at the kitchen table, I do that perfectly. But this is something different. But I go to the service assembly and I run into two old timers from my neighborhood. One was a past United States trustee at large, and I don't expect you to understand what all these, those things are. And the other guy was a past new, uh, Northeast Regional trustee. And I, did, I thought they were just two old guys from the neighborhood. I had no idea that these guys had these positions at one point in their sobriety. And they took me under their wing. And this guy, John Q, who was now my service sponsor, gives me a book a book that maybe some of you guys read in here. It's called The Service Manual, a real bond burner. <laughs> I bet you that's not on Cliff, uh, Chris's bookcase. <laughs> maybe it is. <laughs> but he gave me the book and he said, I want you only to only do one thing right now. And I said, what's that? He goes, I want you to open up to page S20. That's the old book. And there's an excerpt in there. Why do we have a conference? Why do we do the things we do in Alcoholics Anonymous? And it's written by a guy by the name of Bernard Smith, who was Bill Wilson's lawyer, who was a Class A non-alcoholic trustee, who along with Bill Wilson put our structure together, right? And what he writes in there is pretty interesting. What he writes is why we have a conference and why we do the things in Alcoholics Anonymous is not to ensure our sobriety, we're here. You know what to do when a young lady shows up at your front door. Those guys know what to do when a young man shows up at their door. We watch the door. We're instructed to watch the door. That's part of the AA etiquette that Peter talked about. That's part of sponsorship. Yeah, watch the door for the guy who walks in that we don't know. Yes, thank the speaker for speaking at your meeting that just drove four hours to come to your meeting. Whether he, the talk was crappy or not, thank the speaker. Right? Attend your business meetings. Stop buying $30 cups of coffee and put a dollar in a basket. Simple stuff like that. 
So this little excerpt says, we don't do this to ensure our sobriety. But right now, in Syosset, New York, and I said this earlier, there's a guy in this town right now, I could guarantee it, that's cracking open a bottle of whiskey, ready to wash his day away. And little does he know, there's 50 guys in here that have an answer to his problem. Right now, in Syosset, New York, there's a single mom who can't wait to put those three kids down and crack a bottle of wine and wash her day away, not knowing there's a whole bunch of beautiful women in this room right now that have a solution to her problem. Right now, this moment, from this church, to my house, to Chris's house, to Florida, to Peter and Marion's house, and every hospital that's in between, there's a baby being born destined for alcoholism. And I started to understand the gift. And what's the gift? To make sure that those doors are never locked to the alcoholic who comes calling. To make sure that the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous are always open like they were for me on March 28, 1987. Where else can a guy like me or a guy like you or a girl like you go if we don't have this thing and keep this thing intact? Now, do we have disunity? Absolutely, we have disunity in our fellowship. There's a lot of decisions being made in our fellowship. And there's a lot of ignorance in our fellowship that doesn't understand why things are being changed. But that's the, more of a reason why we need to get involved and the district is ground zero for that involvement. So I started to go down this inverted triangle, if you're not familiar with that. That means the groups of Alcoholics Anonymous are in charge of Alcoholics Anonymous. Not the trustees, not the delegates, none of that. It's the groups who run AA. So I became the GSR. I eventually became a DCM. I eventually became the area chair or alternate chair. I became the area chair, the gift. I became the alternate delegate. And I rotated out a year and a half ago as the delegate to the General Service Conference, one of the most unbelievable experiences I've ever had in my life, being at the General Service Conference, making the decisions for AA as a whole. Not my home group, not my area, not my district, for AA as a whole. Do we get it right? Sometimes we don't. Most times we do. I come from the conference, I changed the preamble. How do you like that? <laughs> and I'm not on either side of that opinion, but I'm gonna tell you something right now. I can't tell you how many people came up to me and said, how did that change? And all I can tell you is this, what did your GSR tell you? We don't have one, and I walk away. See, we have a responsibility in Alcoholics Anonymous, and the second tradition talks about that, that when we make our group consciousness, when we make decisions in AA, we better be informed on what we're doing, because that's the gift. Because what we do in Alcoholics Anonymous is really for one reason only, to get the guy and that woman in Syosset, New York, in this room right now. And we do that through a lot of different ways. Tom Iverstow was a great speaker, an old timer in AA, 68 years when he died two years ago. And he always said this, if you're a member of AA, make sure you take a commitment to a place that you never wanna wind up again. So how important is H and I going back to the treatment centers and carrying their message? How important is it to go to the detoxes? How important is it to go to the jails? How important is it to go to your doctor and say, hey, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and if you have any patients that need help, here's my number. It's not a break in the traditions. I wonder if the priest that runs this joint, oh, not joint, this church right here. So, <laughs> I, thought I, was in a, I thought I was in a bar for a second. This, this house of worship, Sorry. It's like a tsunami, a wave is just gonna wash me out here. But again, we get, to, we get the opportunity to share the good news. And the good news is this, there's a way out. There's a way out. It's the gift that we all possess in this room right now, that we have an answer.
A couple of minutes, and I'll be done. Dr. Bob talks about four reasons why we pass this on in his story. If you ever read Dr. Bob's Nightmare, number one, it's a pleasure. How many of us sit at a kitchen table with a young lady across from us or a young man across from us, or an old lady or an old man, it doesn't make a difference, another alky right in front of us? And see, because of shame, guilt, and remorse, they can't lift their head up when they're at their table. Their forehead is tied to their sneakers. But then you start this process. You crack this book open. You start to read. You start to take actions. You start to take those prayers. And all of a sudden, those promises start to occur in their life. And all of a sudden, little Mary, little Joe, their head starts to come up. Wow, I didn't know he had blue eyes. Man, I didn't know she got a black eye from somewhere. All of a sudden, we're eyeball to eyeball. The dead is awakened at our kitchen table, just like I was awakened at someone else's kitchen table, the gift. Dr. Bob talks about a sense of duty. 1965, at the International Convention in Toronto, they came out with a responsibility statement. I am responsible. When anyone, anywhere reaches out for help, for that, I want the hand of AA always to be there. For that, I'm responsible. I screwed that up. I should know that. But you get the point, that we all have a responsibility here. I just can't take this gift, put it in my pocket, and think I'm good to go. Because the paradox of Alcoholics Anonymous is in order to keep it, I got to give it away. Dr. Bob talks about a debt. We owe a debt for our, for our Ebby Thatcher. Who was your Ebby Thatcher? My Ebby Thatcher was a guy by the name of Richard Schnorr, who wasn't even supposed to be in Newark Airport that day, but he was helping another alcoholic guy in a fellowship who couldn't work that night and said, I'll take your shift. What are the chances that that guy would have sat next to me and 12 stepped me on March 27th, 1988? 08, slim to none. I owe a debt to Richie, God rest his soul, who died with 37 years of, sp uh, of sobriety. I've had five tremendous sponsors in 37 years. Richie, the first five years. Bill Grace, who took me through the book for the first time, became the most important guy in my life. Drank again after 16 years and died. Full-blown AIDS. Back in the 80s, a lot of people had AIDS from shooting up and living a lifestyle. He had lesions all over him. He was as big as me at one point. He shrunk to about 100 pounds. He looked like a pencil. I was never afraid to hug that guy. I didn't care what he did. He saved my life. He gave me the gift. Then we had, a, I had an old timer by the name of Audie B for about nine years. Then I had Peter for about, I don't even know, 17, 15, 17 years around there. And now me and him both share the same sponsor, Bob B. Bob is in St. Paul, Minnesota. And every one of them in their own way has shown me and taught me and handed me the gift. The gift of sobriety. I owe a debt to him. I owe a debt to every man and everyone that I've ever, ever had a conversation with in Alcoholics Anonymous. And then Dr. Bob talks about an insurance policy. If you think of a drink, reach for a drunk. Nothing's gonna insure our sobriety more than helping another person. It's the gift. Just going to read two more promises and I'm done. Bill Wilson has a his white light experience. Can't stay so I mean, he's staying sober six months. No one's getting sober. He goes to his wife, you know. Lois just says, Hey, Bill, you're staying sober. Right? But when he comes out of that and having that conversation with Debbie, you know, it's, it was imperative that he carry this message, right? But later on, he goes on to talk about, my wife and I abandon ourselves with enthusiasm to, to the idea of helping other alcoholics to a solution of their problems. It was fortunate. Look how he looked at this. It was fortunate for my old business associates to remain skeptical for a year. We don't need your back right away. Most of us would have been pissed off at that. Bill served completely different. He was awake. He had the gift. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for not bringing me back to work. 
I have the opportunity to go out and try to grab a bunch of drunks and to try to help them and give them what has been so freely given to me. I was not too well at the time, and I was plagued by waves of uh, self-pity and resentment. Yes, our great co-founder was human and had emotions like everyone in this room. This sometimes nearly drove me back to drink, but I soon found out that with all other measures failed, work with another alcoholic would save the day. And here's your first H&I commitment. Many times I have gone to my old hospital in despair. On talking to a man there, I would be amazingly lifted up and set on my feet. It's a design for living that works in a, in a rough going. That's the gift. I could talk to you about the traditions. I could talk to you about the concepts. I could talk to you about world service. I could talk to you guys about a lot of stuff. We could spend the rest of the night here and we could talk about a lot of things that we all know. But if I take everything I know and put it into a filter or, or one of those, whatever you call those things, a funnel, that's it. When it comes out at the end of the funnel, this thing really comes down to one thing and only one thing, one thing only. One drunk talking to another, sharing experience, strength, and hope. And I'll end on this. Might be one of the most important promises we have in our literature. Hopefully I don't cry. Our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we only know a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you could do each day for the man who's still sick. The answers will come if your own house is in order. But obviously you cannot transmit something you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is the great fact for us. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the spirit and you will surely meet some of us as, the, as you trudge the road to happy destiny. May God bless you and, and keep you until then. Thank you so much for my life.